Good afternoon and welcome to Sensors Daily's webinar, Pallet Sensors and IoT Tech Make Businesses Smart, Efficient, and Profitable. I'm Matt Durgis, Editor-in-Chief of Sensors Daily Online, and I will be your host and moderator for today's webinar. Your expert presenters today are Mike Jones, Principal from the Pallet Alliance, and Jayton Talriga, CEO of Vionix. They will be taking you on a highly informative journey through the diverse applications of sensor-equipped pallets and IoT technologies. They will also be showing you how complete solutions work. The presentation will touch upon sensors, wireless technologies, and a range of use cases in multiple verticals. You'll learn how to make pallet tracking efficient and economical through the use of low-cost sensors, wireless technologies, and the ability to reliably integrate tracking technology with wooden pallets. We'll be mixing up hardware and software such as machine learning and artificial intelligence to reduce losses and increase efficiency in the supply chain industry. Before we begin, there's just a few not, uh, items I need to cover here. First, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. However, feel free to submit your questions during the presentation via the Zoom interface, and we will get to them in order at the end of the presentations. Also, should we run out of time before we get to all your questions, we can have them answered via email later. Contact information for both presenters will be available via your chat box during the Q&A session. Second, the webinar is being recorded and will be available later this week on Census Daily website and our YouTube channel. Now, without further elocutions, I'll hand the mic over to Mike Jones. Hello, Mike Jones, Pallet Alliance. Um, so basically, as the slide says, we're gonna be focusing on how our two companies can bring the IoT technology to the shipping supply chain. And as the name of my company suggests, uh, how we can do that primarily using the pallets and more specifically in our case, using a wood pallet as a vehicle for bringing that tracking technology into a supply chain. Um, there are lots of good reasons to do it at the pallet level, which we'll touch upon shortly. And um, you know we have some pretty, we think some pretty interesting solutions and, and cases to apply our technology to. So um, I'm going to go hand it over to Jay just briefly to uh, touch upon what his company does and the value it brings to the exercise. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. My name is Jay, and I'm the CEO of Vionix. So what Vionix does is Vionix is a full service Internet of Things firm. Uh, which has a one platform and endless IoT solutions approach, uh, which enables all the companies to do exactly what they want to do in all the use cases. We connect all the sensors, third party sensors, our homegrown sensors uh, to a single platform. We provide cloud services, we provide unlimited artificial intelligence, logic and rule chains and analytics platform, and also we provide drag and drop dashboards on the platform. Over to you, Mike, about Pallet Alliance. Um, thanks, Jay. Yeah, so Pallet Alliance, basically what we do is we work with manufacturing companies, um, primarily multi-site manufacturing companies, and we go and visit the facilities these companies have and identify really the, the palletization and distribution process and look for opportunities to help them do what they do better, more efficiently, and ultimately to save money on the palletization part of the shipping process. Um, and so, you know, the, the way that it, that it winds up working is it's really a holistic examination of what they're doing and um, their products and looking for places where we can um, help them. And then pulling all that information together and presenting it at a high level to the corporations that we work with. Now, as I mentioned earlier, um, we primarily do that with wooden pallets because they, um, they really do provide uh, the, the opportunity to do customizations and to work with a lot of different products. And, um, you know, uh, they, they're provided, they can be provided at lower cost than plastic options and uh, some of the other technology that's been used in the past for um, palletization. And the manufacturing companies we work with, they use a lot of odd size products and things of this sort. So really when we entered the, the space, um, you know, in terms of looking for IoT data collection opportunities, plastic wasn't really a good option for us. So 
you know, from a, from a high level, most of the goods that move in the U.S. Um, and elsewhere are are moved on wooden pallets. Um, it's it's a really good solution in a lot of different ways. They're easily repairable, they're widely accessible, and uh, it's an inexpensive material to build pallets out of. And so then the question becomes: if we want to continue to use that platform, and we we will um, for the foreseeable future. How can we wed IoT data collection to that material in a reliable and affordable way? The affordable part is easy-ish and getting easier. The cost of trackers continues to decline. Um, and you know, as there's more competition in that space, the solutions themselves are becoming less expensive, um, at least for, I would say, smaller size tracking operations. But doing it with wood historically has amounted to tacking a sensor onto the side of a wood pallet um, and kind of crossing your fingers. And the, the reason for that is pallets get used. So they get struck with forklifts, pallets rub up against each other, there's impact, they're shaking, the sensors just become dislodged and it sort of defeats the purpose of tracking it if you can't do it reliably. So what we did, and this isn't necessarily the only way of doing it, was we reached out to America's largest telecom company who has its own IoT development uh, wing and said, okay, we've got this idea about how we can actually integrate the electronics with a wooden pallet and thereby keep the, the sensor safe and also um, you know, keep them from being dislodged and this sort of thing. And at the end of a long development process, we identified a way to do it. And it's something that we've had out in the field and it works really well. And you can actually use a wood pallet to do IoT data collection with the same level of reliability that you can get with a, a plastic or composite pallet. And it really does open the door to much broader implementation market wide of IoT tracking to the supply chain. And so the problems that this allows you to address are some companies have large recycling pools um, where they have a custom pallet that they use to circulate internally uh, to stores, distribution facilities, things of this sort, um, but they lose a lot of those pallets. And so the ability to look at a wood pallet, a custom pallet and say, okay, where are these things leaving the pool? potentially allows for, for lots of savings because then you're not having to replace those custom pallets uh, with new pallets every time. Obviously, there's a lot of lost product. Um, if you don't need to use a conspicuous plastic pallet, you can begin to keep tabs on a, a large, larger range of products. And um, you know that, that's, that's important. You don't be losing things, obviously. Uh, spoilage, um, I'll talk a little bit more about why that it makes sense to do that at the pallet level versus a truck in a moment. Um, you know, the, the problem of supply chain visibility, if you can't see the pallet, which most of your goods are shipping on, then you're losing resolution at some point. And then also kind of along the same lines, you can't really identify potential inefficiencies in your supply chain if you can't see them. So from a solution standpoint, In terms of the lost pallets in a recycling pool, if you know where those pallets are going, then you can patch the holes, the sources of loss. Are, are there handling practices that's, that are causing the pallets to get damaged and discarded earlier than they ought to be? Are pallets just getting left in different places? Um, you know, are the stores just leaving them out back instead of returning them for backhauls to the manufacturing facilities? Um, and when you find those sources of loss, you can change the handling practice. You can say, okay, well, you know, obviously, Bob, you need to be following the processes um, or the store needs to do a better job of informing their employees about how those pallets ought to be handled. Um, as you get those pallets back, obviously, you're saving money. So, and in terms of lost product, the, the first and most obvious one is you know, if you have a pallet of liquor and it goes missing, um, if you know where it is, you can go get it. Um, if you know when it leaves your supply chain, you can stop whatever activity is that's causing those things to slip out. And so using GPS and derived locations, um, you can 
pinpoint those areas where the product is disappearing and um, fill them. And so <clears throat> zooming in a little bit, product gets lost in warehouse warehouses. People need to track, uh, you know, where inventory levels, where in the facilities things are, are winding up. And so with sufficiently high resolution, you can get your employees straight to the shelf where the thing is, or, you know, do inventory counts without having to do it manually. So that's, uh, you know, that's part of another technology. Um, product damage is a biggie. And if you know which carriers say, uh, you know, are, are damaging more product, you can switch them. Um, you can find places in the supply chain where things are being dropped. Um, you can use it to find out again, which shippers are doing the best job. Um, you can change your packaging. I mean, there's any number of things you can do once you know throughout the product's journey where it is that, you know, whatever your threshold values are, are being exceeded. And then spoilage, I mentioned that already. So one of the things that you hear is um, when, you're, when you're out on the market is, well, my goods are moving on refrigerated trailers and we always know what the temperature is. Well, the, the, the problem is in, in some of those cases, maybe in most, is that you've got the temperature in one place in the trailer, but what happens if your palletized goods are on the other end of the trailer from say the sensor? Um, what tracking it at the pallet level allows you to do is say, okay, this is what's happening to my good. And you can take steps to ameliorate the situation if say your threshold values are being exceeded. So one of the, one of the ways this technology can work is you can receive an alert to your cell phone or via email and know, okay, at this point in the, the process now my, my whatever my threshold value is is being exceeded so you can call the trucking company or you can call the loading dock where the pallet is or you can use these to make more macro scale decisions i mean are certain carriers typically tagging closer to the line than others tagging closer to the line than others um so you can really start to get a a holistic view on what's happening to your perishable goods in the supply chain and use that data again to change practices if necessary, to change carriers if necessary, to hold stores accountable if product is becoming uh, spoiled while it's sitting outside longer than it should. But, but that's another example of where, you know, knowing what's happening to your pallet of goods uh, is, is a really valuable thing and it can produce considerable savings. And then, yeah, the question of supply chain visibility and inefficiencies. If, if you know where the pallet is, all kinds of things become possible. I mentioned earlier inventory level tracking that, that, BLA, that BLE, low energy uh, Bluetooth tags allow you to do. Um, you can do that with LoRa. You can do that with, a, with a, any number of different technologies. But basically, you have the visibility without people having a hand key or scan inventory in. What's actually sitting in my warehouse now? Um, do, I, do I need that much there? You can incorporate those pallets into your ERP solution, uh, your WMS solution, and begin to track your inventory in real time automatically. Um, you can see where product is being hung up as it moves through your supply chain, again, at the pallet level. Um, you, know, you can see seasonal variability. Um, again, all this stuff can be analyzed more easily once you have the data at hand and the steps involved in manual collection are, are removed from it. You can spend the time you were using to manually track inventory to actually process the data you're getting now that you have visibility into it. Um, so the nice thing I, I guess about that, um, you know, again, about that level of visibility is you have the potential to track that product from the moment product hits the pallet until it winds up at the end customer for a true end-to-end -end solution, um, which opens the door to more just-in-time manufacturing because then you can find out, okay, so exactly from how long I order, is it palletized and how long from there to it actually makes it to my end customer. And so that's sort of an overview. It's a high-level overview, but 
you know, sort of the how and the why of using IoT pallet tracking to discover information that could be hidden in your pallet, the pallet piece of your supply chain. And so Jay will talk more about how these devices specifically accomplish this and, and also the different technologies and how they can work together. So, Jay? I hope you can see my screen. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, so I will talk uh, about some IoT infrastructure, what uh, uh, it takes to uh, do the whole pallet tracking uh, as a system. Uh, so <clears throat> the first part in the IoT infrastructure comes is sensing. Um, so sensing is, we have to use uh, lots of sensors. Uh, for an example, a basic one would be an accelerometer, uh, a temperature sensor, a humidity sensor, an impact sensor, or a gyroscope, or, uh, you know, or a GPS device to do GPS tracking. So we have to sense the data on the local level of the pallet where some electronics get installed. Now, once you are sensing the data, then you have to worry about the transporting the data to the internet somehow. So either uh, you are doing it by uh, Bluetooth, or you are doing it by Wi-Fi, or you are doing it by cellular, or NB-IoT, or LoRa, or Sigfox. There are so many uh, technologies coming out in past two years that it has become uh, very hard to choose for the end customer which technology would be uh, best in their use case. So somehow we have to get the data to the uh, internet. Once the data goes on the internet, we need to figure out how the data is going to get stored. Uh, so there is a very, uh, this is a very key term here, how do we store the data in the database as in, uh, for an example, if you're tracking 10 million pallets and 10 million pallets are generating data, let's say once an hour, then you are getting 100 million pings uh, in a day and that's a lot of data. And so how do you manage all the data? What does needs to get stored on the database, what is valuable information, what is invaluable information, basically managing the big data on the database and how long do you want to store the data. So there are a lot of uh, questions which get answered depending upon what kind of use case uh, a specific uh, uh, user is needing. Once the data is in the database, uh, it moves towards some uh, something called something I call it making sense of the data. So how do you make sense of that data? Now, either you can make sense by some kind of an uh, AI artificial intelligent engine or some kind of a logic uh, logical engine where it is checking the sensor data from different aspects uh, of the pallets and also getting data from third party resources like maybe weather station or driving behaviors for on a truck and then understanding what is happening to my product and then making a predetermined and uh, a, a decision which has a high confidence level of what needs to be done to that pallet. And that's what making sense of the data would be. After making sense of the data, uh, there are a lot of things happening. So one is control. So once you have the data, what do you do with the data? Uh, so you can do two things. One is either you can take an action on the data or you can only just provide awareness. So that's where dashboards come into play. So uh, uh, so now you have dashboards where you can view all the data uh, and it makes you aware, it creates notifications for you that uh, this particular pallet just got dropped from the second floor. So it's just a notification to you uh, saying this pallet got dropped. Uh, on the other side, action is if you're seeing pallets being uh, being being routed to incorrect locations, or a pallet went to a distributor location and never got returned. And while you're tracking the pallet, you can automatically create notifications for uh, your drivers or pickup delivery uh, folks who's saying, okay, please go and pick up a pallet there, automatically creating a route there. So there could be an automatic engine which is created for uh, customers to uh, to, to manage their businesses more efficiently so they don't have to uh, worry about that. In the 
uh, in this whole control action awareness part, you have uh, four different segments, which is uh, awareness, uh, interest, desire, and action. So uh, four different uh, uh, four different values go into the play. So awareness is just receiving all the data and how you are displaying the data, correct? So nowadays, as uh, uh, as more and more uh, better UI user interface uh, dashboards are coming in, uh, you can graphically plot a lot of data. Uh, till today, a lot of companies are still doing it in uh, Excel sheet format or uh, or a very tabular view format where it is hard to data mine. So all that needs to be uh, converted to in a graphical format so you can easily find, okay, what is happening and what is not happening and create an interest level there saying, okay, this area is, a, is of my interest. Uh, if the pallet goes above, uh, above 70 degree temperature and you are shipping a product which has a temperature range of only 40 to 60 degrees, then it needs to create an alert, an automatic action needs to be created to the driver of the truck or to the warehouse where the pallet is stored or to a distribution center saying, why is this pallet stored in a higher temperature? Because the, the products it contains is out of the temperature range. So, uh, and it also helps uh, doing, uh, uh, doing the safety of the product. Uh, for an example, uh, some pallets are being tracked uh, from Mexico to California, which have apples and oranges. Uh, and uh, now those things get delivered to uh, major grocery stores. So now those pallets are being tracked with the temperature, humidity requirements uh, from all the way from the farmer to all the way to the store, how the whole product was actually maintained. Uh, and managed and how long it took to get there. So is it fresh, is it not fresh? So a lot of aspects go into there. <clears throat> After this whole IoT infrastructure, now we have sensed the data, now we have transported the data, we have got the database, uh, we are doing a lot of things, but one big key thing appears is security of all that data. So uh, security is actually taken very lightly uh, uh, at this time in the world. Uh, but as more and more IoT technologies get deployed, uh, security will play a major role in all the businesses because uh, if your platform and your system is not properly secure or fully secure, uh, it can cause very adverse effects where uh, if some bot can just start generating, let's say, random sensor data and start sending it to your platform in some fashion, and all of a sudden you're getting a lot of junk data and your automatic processing engine or your AI engine starts processing all that data and start making incorrect decisions for you and uh, spoils your whole business environment. Uh, uh, one of the key ways is where uh, all the hardware we manufacture contains uh, a very secure element uh, which has uh, rotating keys uh, and chips uh, which are rotated on an hourly basis which has a uh, complete 100% secure environment to uh, to a lot of the cases. <clears throat> uh, let me talk about some of the wireless technologies which we are currently using for pallet tracking. So uh, there are three major uh, technologies we are using for pallet tracking or asset tracking purposes. Uh, one of them is Bluetooth low energy, which is about restricted to about 100 feet. Uh, second one is uh, LoRaWAN or LoRa, which is stands for long range, uh, and the small trackers can reach up to about half a mile range uh, to the gateway. And then the NBIoT, which is cellular, which is uh, global, so which is e easier to track on shipping containers and uh, trains and things like that. So some pros and cons. Uh, uh, Bluetooth is a very good technology if you have a very large warehouse and uh, you are trying to track the pallets. Where are they inside the warehouse? Are they indoor or are they outdoors? Uh, so if you have a very confined space and you want to track uh, where my assets are, not just pallets, but it could be anything else you want to track, then Bluetooth would be probably the right way to go. Uh, currently, there's one more technology, which is ultra wideband, uh, which is coming up, which has a more accurate uh, locationing system, uh, but uh, uh, but the battery level is not there yet as per the BLE is, where the BLE beacons can last up to one year, two years, three years. Uh, we have one beacon which actually lasts seven years. Uh, life cycle is a little bit bigger, but it lasts seven years for tracking purposes. And um, uh, ultra wideband is not there yet. 
Uh, LoRa is a very good uh, technology which can also complement uh, Bluetooth as a backhaul technology, or it can also be used for uh, tracking. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, let's take an example of the pallets. Uh, you want to track pallets. Uh, you have a manufacturer. They have 100 distributors. Pallets go all out to 100 distributors. Now pallets don't come back. So they just need to identify which distributor has these pallets. So all the distributors can have a LoRa gateway installed there and whatever pallets are going to be at their location, they're going to ping to the gateway and this way you can understand, okay, which pallets are at which distributor, who's returning it, who's not returning it. And it's a very simple system and it works very efficiently and it has a very long battery life. NB-IoT cellular is, uh, again, it's that's a cellular technology. So where you can actually track uh, your pallets and assets on the road, on the train, whenever you're moving, you're not in a confined space anymore, like at a distributor location or a warehouse location. So you could be anywhere in the world and uh, you could track uh, with the NB-IoT. So these are the three major means which you can get the sensor data to the cloud and back and forth to your sensors. Some of the sensors to the pallets we use is temperature sensors uh, to monitor temperature of the pallet and the environment of the uh, pallet. Uh, humidity sensors the same way. Uh, we do have a shock sensor which also uh, logs uh, what kind of shock uh, uh, the, the pallet is getting while being on a truck or uh, drop detection where if somebody is lifting it up on a forklift and just drops the pallet or uh, pallet has a very big impact we can uh, we can detect how uh, much impact the pallet got. So this way you can also uh, relate to your product, which is on the pallet to see if it is, uh, uh, if it is still good or not. Uh, we're also monitoring barometric pressure. Uh, there is light detection. Uh, we also have location. So we have GPS based location or ad hoc location. So uh, real location means is it is by GPS or by Bluetooth triangulation. Ad hoc location is by LoRaWAN, where you have a general idea of, okay, we are in this half mile radius uh, at this distribution center. Then we also have weight sensors. We're currently working on weight sensors to identify how much product is actually on the pallet. So uh, for an example, let's say if, uh, if, it's, uh, if a company is selling fans and one pallet has 30 fans on it, it will have a certain weight. And when the fans get taken off the pallet, you can actually do a real-time, just-in-time inventory how many fans are on that pallet uh, by the detection of weight as people take uh, products off the pallet. <clears throat> Some other applications uh, uh, Vionics uh, is, is uh, working on or uh, actively working on is one is social distancing. Uh, we actually have released an app for social distancing where uh, uh, enterprise companies can download uh, that app and also we have a bracelet version where it uh, uh, it maintains a social distance for six feet uh, for people and has both the versions for contact tracing and non-contact tracing. Um, another application is asset tracking. So we have uh, a lot of different uh, hardware software all combined for indoor outdoor asset tracking where if you want to track a forklift going inside a building where it is and then it goes outside, uh, where is a forklift, what was the usage information, how much it is used, how it is behaving, uh, uh, things like that. Now, plus you can also track all the assets uh, you have. So if you have raw material you want to track or however you want to track, uh, it's all possible today. Uh, we're working in smart city initiatives uh, with a couple of cities. Uh, in the U.S. itself for uh, copper theft prevention and uh, uh, gunshot detection and uh, some things like that. Uh, smart hospitals where we are actually tracking all the equipment in the hospitals where the ECG machine is or where the x-ray machine is in the building. Uh, we're also tracking patients if they are, uh, if, they, if, they, if they're falling, if they, if they fell on the floor, we can detect it. If they need some attention, we can detect it. Uh, we have some sensors which go on the patient which can manage their uh, behavior or, or monitor their behavior, how much they're moving, how much they are not moving, uh, did they walk today, how much did they walk today. Um, uh, and then also uh, some sensors go on to uh, the nurses and the doctors to monitor how many times did the nurse actually visit the patient, how many times did the doctor visit the patient. Uh, 
did the patient got moved from the bed uh, or not to prevent ulcerations. Uh, uh, we're also working on something new on the hospitals for the, uh, for the smart food tray system. So we're making smart food trays where um, when the food gets delivered to a certain uh, patient in the room, uh, we can actually sound an alarm if the wrong food plate was delivered to that specific room with the wrong allergic ingredients in the food. Uh, hotel safety, we are uh, making all the hotels and the hospitality industry smart by monitoring a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, uh, sensors in the, in the hotels and also providing panic buttons to uh, all, the, uh, all the hotel workers there in case if there's an emergency, they can push the panic button and we can locate them indoors uh, where exactly they are and alert the proper authorities where they are. Uh, refrigeration is another big uh, uh, vertical where you can monitor a lot of uh, 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 a lot of temperature humidity for all the cold storage or uh, shipping containers uh, uh, things like that to see if your product is good or not good and also automatically control the uh, the, the heating system uh, with that also uh, to this I'm gonna turn over to uh, uh, Mike to uh, work on the case study. All right. Can you see my? Oh, probably not. Hold on. Probably need to share my screen. Or before you change, I can quickly show one of the dashboards too, actually. Oh, I just about stole the stole it already, I think. Can you guys share my screen? Or see my screen? Yes, go ahead. Okay. All right. I should probably get to the right place in here. Okay, so the case study that we're going to talk about is the first one that I mentioned, or in the spirit of the first one I mentioned, which is a large national sort and repair operation where the manufacturer essentially owns a large pool of pallets um, and they are supplied with new pallets and then those pallets are supposed to circulate from the manufacturing facility to distribution centers to stores, then back to a pallet depot to be processed and then go back to the manufacturing plant or be used elsewhere within their system. Um, this works right most of the time. Um, and most of the time meaning they have well north of 2 million. I just use that as kind of a, you know, a, a base number. Um, and, you know, many, many, many of those pallets actually wind up uh, going back to where they're supposed to go. But because it's only semi-closed, meaning some of those pallets go to job sites, um, some of them wind up being used for what's more or less known to be a one-way trip to a vendor or something of this sort. Um, you know, and, and some of them just get discarded. Pallets leave the pool uh, on a semi-regular basis and to the tune of needing to replace in the ballpark of 600,000 or more every year, um, you know, which of course costs quite a lot of money. Now, what we don't know, um, although we do know more about it now, is what number of those are those legit purposes I mentioned, which are going to job sites and it's just not worth what it costs to get the pallet back or, you know, which is being sent on a one-way trip. And, you know, but where are things that just we, we don't know about? or the, you know, the, the customer doesn't know about, where maybe they're going somewhere that they could be recovered from, but nobody's really thought about that as a potential place um, to, to look for pallets to go missing. Um, or maybe there are assumptions about the number of pallets that are getting missed in a certain process or lost in a certain process, and that's, but, but that's a really, say, low number relative to what's actually being lost. And so there are theoretically opportunities where when you, are able to identify where are those things getting lost, where they shouldn't get lost. Um, you know, you, you might be able to, to do something about that volume if it's not appropriate. 
Um, you know, and another element of the problem is you can't track them all. Uh, it wouldn't make sense to track them all. If, if what you're primarily interested in is tracking the palette, does it make sense to, you know, depending on the tracking technology you want to use, does it make sense to spend 70 or $80 to track a $10 palette? Um, no, not really. But does it make sense to spend something really fractional of that to find out where, you know, the, the whole pool of 2 million um, pallets are going? Well, that, that would make more sense. And so the solution for us, and I'd say it's the front end of a solution, but, but not an insignificant one, was to take just a sliver, tiny, tiny sample set and outfit those 50 pallets with a basically a full service tracker, for lack of a better way of putting it, which would record all kinds of different data. Um, but the one we're primarily interested in being GPS and derived location for that palette, um, which, you know, instead of having it be an operation where you're tracking, you know, 600,000 to 2 million pallets at the cost of, at the time anyway, 100 bucks a pop, you know, you're only tracking a, a tiny number of that. You're only spending five grand. Um, what it did in the event, and, and I will admit that part of this was luck, but part of it wasn't. I mean, part of we we learned some things as a matter of course, um, was identifying two sources of loss. And, you know, one of those amounting to a, a large number of pallets that were exiting the pool in a way that nobody had thought about before. Um, and, you know, as it turned out, it was it was just a complete oversight. Um, you know, in terms of having that part of the operation be included in the corporate sort and repair operation. And so patching that hole, meaning including those pallets in the larger operation, um, you know, making sure that they're being sorted and processed and returned to circulation in an optimal way could end up saving the customer north of 75. And that, that's a pretty conservative estimate of, of what those savings will look like, um, which, you know, is a huge return on the investment. But also, once you've made the changes involved in bringing that particular hole into, or excuse me, bringing that particular stream into the main program, that's going to be year over year savings. And also what it led to and will continue to lead to is asking questions about what other things like that, which we really hadn't thought about, are there? Um, you know, what other opportunities are there that, you know, we, we don't even know to look for because we're not aware that that, that is going on. Um, so it will be an operation that we expand and, and we expect to, to deliver um, really large returns on, on what will in the event be a really a minimal investment relative to the, the potential savings and improvements. And down the line, you know, when you transition from tracking the pallet to improve the pallet operation, it really could open the door to tracking the stuff that's moving on the pallets, but doing it in a way where you're not losing such a large fraction of, of the pallets that are being tracked. So, um, you know, and that's one of the one of the applications that we've looked for is using this kind of sample set to troubleshoot any um, operation with the aim being to make the pallet pool as tight as possible before a larger scale deployment of trackers can be are sent out. So with that, I will turn the uh, turn the mic as it were over to the host. Thank you guys, great presentation. Uh, we got a couple questions here. Uh, the first one is for Jay. Somebody in the audience would like you to talk more about security while managing big data. Yeah, so security itself is, um, is its own topic in itself. It's a, it itself is a very big industry, uh, but um, uh, on the IoT level, uh, uh, we see actually a lot of sensors today out there, probably 80 to 85 percent of all the sensors do not have uh, do not have a proper security enable in them. It is actually very quickly to hack a lot of sensors and start sending uh, uh, rubbish data to a lot of uh, 
uh, to the to the platform, and uh, that is not good. Um, so when a large company is deploying a proper solution, uh, security measures have to be taken. Number one is you have to make sure that the hardware, which is a source of the data, has decent level of security built in, either by a security chip or a cryptographic chip or a secure uh, element in there. Uh, uh, the encryption nowadays just does, doesn't work because uh, uh, depending upon what kind of encryption it is, but a lot of the cases, uh, everybody uses a standard encryption from microcontroller to sending it to the cloud. And it's uh, not that uh, hard to hack. Um, uh, uh, if you can uh, send me more, uh, if you can email me with some specific security questions in your use case, I will be able to uh, answer that question in a more uh, defined way. Okay, <clears throat> we have a question here from Mobin. Uh, it's not directed to anyone in specific, but Mobin would like to know what are the minimum sensors required besides location? Well, I think the sensors just depend on what kind of sensors, what do you want to sense, correct? So one customer may say, okay, I want to sense my apples and I just want to care about temperature, right? So if they only care about temperature, then we only need a temperature sensor. Uh, if they want to know about location of the product, then we can have a GPS or any other location type or ad hoc location type on there. So it truly just depends on uh, what does the end customer require in a solution and that's where uh, uh, Vionix and Palette Alliance come together to come and understand, okay, what are your, uh, what is your problem? Where, where is your bottleneck, right? We understand that uh, problem first and then come to you and propose you a complete solution uh, to how it would benefit you in the right way. Yeah, and, that, and I'll just add on to that. So one of the, you know, one of the things that we've looked into and deployed out into the field, even it, it has light sensing on it because you may have, say, plastic film or, something that, that, well, obviously is light sensitive that's going to be sitting outside, say, or shouldn't be outside, and you need to know, well, was it exposed to any sunlight? So, uh, as Jay was suggesting, that the range of requests is, is it's pretty expansive, and so, you know, as you're looking at some of these custom use cases, really, the more tools you have at your disposal, the more sensor capabilities, the, the better equipped you are going to be to handle um, these uh, you know, Correct. customer requests. Just like say, like I'm, I'm sharing a dashboard real quick here to show you, like say currently we're showing a US map on a dashboard where we have uh, all the pallets wherever they are and we can actually uh, look at them and when you click a specific pallet, you can go inside and see what his uh, travel history was as a location uh, and uh, see where the uh, pallet has been and has not been. You can zoom in specifically and see which location the pallet went and which not went and where it went. Uh, also, along with that, we can also get, let's say, temperature and humidity data of the pallet, how it has performed. We can also get impact sensors. So we can see here the impact sensor. Somebody basically dropped this pallet at this time. And uh, uh, if you need to investigate more on that, we can just, we can literally just uh, highlight this area here and see what happened in this pallet area. And uh, you can highlight it more. And then when you go to the map, it will tell you at which location uh, this basically uh, pallet drop happen at this location and at this location. So it's a very intuitive thing and then we can create uh, a lot of stuff. Also, you can see the temperature change within that time domain uh, um, and, and things like that. I hope that answers the question. Okay, we have a multi-part question here. How many of the deployed sensors are using cellular IoT, specifically CAT M1 or MB-IoT? And what are your monthly network subscription fees? So currently on the cellular IoT stuff, uh, uh, there are some companies who are using uh, NB-IoT uh, for pallet tracking per se, but for uh, CAT M1 is being used for other applications for asset tracking. Uh, and uh, uh, <clears throat> and uh, those companies are pretty much uh, the very the larger companies uh, who are trying to track the pallets from all the way to the manufacturing facility to the end customer where it goes at 10 different places to uh, third party distributors or retailers or however it travels. And those guys are using uh, NBIOT and cellular uh, to track their pallets. Uh, as far as the pricing free concern is, uh, uh, 
So the pricing fee can depend upon, depending upon how many, what is the volume of your pallets? Uh, what kind of connection do we get? Which carrier do we use? How much data we are sending? How many sensors do we have on there? So it all depends on how much data we are sending. So it's not that a simple question to uh, answer that what are the fees, but it just it just, just ranges. So uh, if you can, we can talk offline on that and understand the use case and provide an answer to you. Yeah, and, and I'll just piggyback on that and say that the, the sort of scale of operations that we've been looking at, having thrown out that um, 2 million transaction number, I mean, it, it's not practical for just about anybody to want to have each of those devices have those kinds of subscription services uh, with them. And so things like the LoRa tech or BLE start to, to make more sense when you're talking about tracking that and, and then piggybacking off of, say, truck telemetry or subscriptions at you know, warehouse facilities and distribution centers and end store locations and, and using that to construct the end-to-end -end connectivity. The, those, those sort of solutions start to make more sense when you're dealing with an enterprise operation. But, you know, as Jay suggested, it's, I, I don't think there is a right solution to any of, um, to, to, uh, for everybody. I mean, each one is going to have to have something custom done or people are just going to be paying too much because, you know, I think few goods are worth having, uh, you know, a, a subscription, you know, for each and every pallet. Okay, Alex wants to know, is your platform capable of monitoring multiple solutions and providing single monitoring and dashboarding platform? Uh, yes, so our platform is uh, very, very scalable. It is, the platform is not just built to uh, do pallet tracking. We can actually ingest the data from uh, wherever we need to actually. If you already have sensors, we already have devices, you already have machines, we can just collect the data from them, uh, any third party devices or our own devices, and we can put all of them onto uh, one, uh, one, one, one database and then we can do all the analysis, we can do all the rule chains, we can do all the business logics right there on the platform and then provide uh, whatever uh, information we need to provide. You can have different departments uh, signed up doing different things on there and you can build unlimited dashboards. So our platform has a drag and drop dashboard functionality where you can actually build a dashboard in minutes instead of, uh, instead of weeks, months or years for somebody developing the whole thing. So, uh, and uh, our team of engineers is, is, has a global presence and, uh, and we can build any solution we want at the end of the day on that platform and combine different solutions. I hope that answers the question. Okay. Uh, Edouard would like to know two things. How is the sensor protected on the pallet? And where do you fix the sensor on the pallet? Um, I'm going to have Mike answer this question, but we do have a, a utility patent and uh, a, a Pallet Alliance has a utility patent and a, a patent granted to how to bound the sensor on the pallet. But Mike, over to you. Yeah, uh, the patent has actually been, uh, the application has been approved, but we don't actually have the registration quite yet. But um, the, the question really is, uh, or the answer to the question is, it is, um, it depends. Um, so there, there is no exactly right um, place for, you know, you, you can't say for all pallets, right? So it depends on the configuration, it depends on the product, it depends on the kind of sensing and this kind of thing. But really what it amounts to is integrating the electronics with the pallet in such a way that they aren't exposed to outside damage. And, um, you know, that involves uh, a fair amount of engineering work, component selection, and uh, analysis of the load that's going to be shipped on the pallet and these kinds of things. So I'm happy to take that question offline um, for a specific application, but you know, for the purposes of the call, it, it much like just about everything else we've talked about is it's, it's kind of a custom solution. Okay, great. That's all we have time for today. I wanna to thank Mike Jones, principal from the Pallet Alliance and Jayton Talrega, CEO of Bionex, for a great presentation, and I want to thank all of our attendees for spending time with us today. Once again, a recording of this presentation will be available for download at sensorsdaily.com and our YouTube channel later this week. Be sure to register for our upcoming webinars and visit Sensors Daily for your daily dose of technology news. Thanks, and have a great day.